Uh, I'm Veronique Schaffawi from the uh, University of Technology of Compiègne and uh, with uh, Jonas Fredriksson we have the pleasure to open this session uh, on the sensor and data fusion. So uh, we will see four presentations and the first uh, uh, speaker is Alexandre Schiel and uh, his, his talk is uh, on multi-sensor, multi-object tracking of vehicles using high resolution radars. Well, thanks for the introduction and a good morning to everyone. Um, so for autonomous driving, it is very important that we know where other vehicles are in our surrounding and what they do. So for this task, we usually have tracking modules which are able to estimate the states of those objects recursively over time. That is, they estimate the precision, the velocity, or the yaw rate for each other. Um, this is based on the sensor data that we get from our onboard, onboard sensors, and uh, in production cars, radar sensors have been very popular. Now, in recent years, we've seen some advances in radar technology, auto automotive radar technology, which has led to increased sensor resolution. Now, we've mounted two of such sensors in one of our test vehicles, which is the one here on the right, so the white one, and we've mounted the sensor in the left corner and on the right corner. And what we, we like to, would like to do is to track other vehicles using these sensors. Now, before we see how this is done, I'll just show you a short video of how the data looks like that we're working with. So basically you can see a bird's eye perspective of the scene, you can see the fields of view of both sensors which overlap in the center area, and we're working on target level, that is we get radar targets which consist of a uh, range, an angle, and a Doppler velocity, which is indicated by the lines uh, that you can see here, so that's the magnitude of the Doppler, Doppler velocity. Now if we want to work with this data, um, we face three challenges. So the first challenge is uh, data processing. Um, and well, basically, we're dealing with a so-called extended object problem because we're having multiple measurements per object. You can see this in the example of, uh, right there, where we can see a vehicle which is being passed by us uh, on the right. Now, we get up around 10 to 15 measurements here, and we can clearly, uh, clearly see the shape or well, get an estimate of how the size of this object is, which is a very good, uh, good thing because it's more information for us. The problem is that uh, classical tracking algorithms, like the common filter, for example, are not designed to work uh, with such data. They just uh, expect one measurement per time step. Now here we have multiple measurements. Um, there's another thing that we have to consider. If we want to uh, use all available data, uh, including the Doppler measurements, we're facing some ambiguity. And we can see this from the second example, which are also measurements from a vehicle. Here are just two measurements. And if we uh, have Doppler measurements, we only measure the radial velocity uh, the radial component of the actual vehicle motion. So basically there are different velocity vectors which could have caused the same uh, Doppler measurement. This is even more complicated if we look at turning vehicles because we're having compound, uh, compound velocities due to the additional rotational motion that we see. So and this uh, combined vector uh, looks different on each, uh, every location that we have on the rigid body. Um, so basically we're not able to fully uh, estimate the motion state of such an object um, from just one time frame. And that is maybe one of the reasons why uh, classical radar tracking algorithms are of, often limited to parallel traffic only and do not consider uh, turning vehicles or cross traffic. Now, the second challenge that we're looking at is um, we're having a multi-object problem, which basically means we have multiple vehicles in, the field, in our field of view, and also we receive some plotter measurements, for example, from uh, static objects. Now, this yields uh, some questions, uh, which are how many objects are present, um, which measurements belong to which object, and which measurements are cluttered. So we have to somehow make an association decision, and this decision is not always easy to make, as you can see from the example just on top here, because we do have some measurements uh, which origi originate from a vehicle, which are those here, but we do have close-by color measurements from static objects. And if you make a wrong uh, association decision here, uh, we might lose our track or at least deteriorate our tracking result. Third challenge is sensor fusion. If we want to uh, achieve redundancy or increase our field of view, we will have to use multiple sensors. And, well, still we want one consistent estimate of what the vehicles do in our environment, so we need to somehow fuse the data. Now, these three challenges lead me to the goal. What we're trying to achieve here is we want to get a design an algorithm which is able to tackle those three challenges that I mentioned uh, systematically. We want to use all available data that we have um, which includes the Doppler measurements fully. We want to provide size estimates because we want to be to use the high resolution data that we're uh, receiving. And uh, also we would like to work the algorithm uh, 
we want, we want the, al the algorithm to work for arbitrary maneuvers and not to limit it just to parallel traffic. Now, how do we do this? So basically, we're using a technique uh, from the tracking community, which has become very popular in the tracking community in the last about 10 years, and it's called finite set statistics. So the idea behind finite set statistics is that instead of just looking at a single state vector as classical tracking algorithms do and estimating a posterior distribution over the single state vector, we're looking at an uh, entire multi-object state, which is represented by a so-called random finite set. Now basically, this is a set which is, uh, consists of several state vectors, so the elements of the set are state vectors. And the set is random because we're dealing with random variables in the set, the random state vectors, but also the number of elements that we're uh, looking at so the, uh, is random because we don't know how many objects are there, and that's something that we would like to estimate. A modeler, a scientist from the United States, has shown that we can extend the classical base filter concept for single object tracking to multi-object tracking. So we can formulate a base filter which <coughs> estimates the posterior distribution over the multi-object state, over the set, recursively over time using classical prediction and update steps. Um, so this is just the same procedure as you would do in a classical single object tracking uh, approach, just that we're dealing with densities over sets here instead of densities over state vectors. Now in the update step, um, we, combine all, we also combine all the measurements that we receive in a set and then we have some uh, multi-object likelihood function, which is here, uh, which kind of gives us the relation between the measurements that we uh, receive and the, uh, uh, the multi-object state that we have. And since we all have all information, all measurements at the same time here, we have some, a lot of modeling freedom for, um, for our measurement process. Now, the problem here is that um, the, this multi-object base filter is not easily solvable, as the classical base filter is, for example. Uh, but there are some uh, solutions to it, and the filter that we're using is the so-called uh, labeled multi filter for extended objects, which has just been uh, presented recently, so a couple of months ago. And I'll just give you a short intuition of what it does. So basically, we provide the measurements of this filter as an entire set, and then internally, the filter uh, uses different clustering hypotheses of which measurements belong together and belong to one object, or which measurements are uh, clutter measurements. So we consider multiple variants, as you can see here, for example, there are two examples. And then also we have some hypotheses about how our multi-object multi state looks like. Looks like. So, um, for example, we just have track one, two, and three, or we also have just maybe track one and three, and so on. Now then the filter internally uh, evaluates multiple association hypotheses, which are possible and plausible. And um, by doing this uh, and evaluating the multi-object likelihood, we can update our posterior distribution. Now, what we uh, get at the end is, uh, um, well, the posterior distribution, which consists of a density over each uh, track's state vector, so just as we would receive in a classical approach. But we also receive a, an existence probability, which tells us how sure we are that this uh, uh, track is present. Now, by using this filter, we uh, tackled two of the three challenges that I've been mentioning. Um, so, the first challenge was, well, obviously, we're dealing with a multi-object problem, so we're using an algorithm that is designed to just solve such problems. And secondly, we used this uh, algorithm to tackle the third challenge, which was sensor fusion, because we use it in a centralized fusion scheme, um, where we just have one filtering instance, and we provide all the measurements from the different sensors to this filter, and each time new measurements arrive, we update the posterior distribution, and so just keep one uh, combined posterior distribution. Now, the challenge that's left is uh, data processing, because the me uh, multi-object measurement likelihood still needs a model which tells us how is the object state related to the measurements that we receive. So um, here we use a measurement model which we've already presented yesterday for the single object case in an associated paper, uh, which we refer to as the direct scattering model. Now, in the beginning, I told you that it's very difficult to infer the object state from given measurements, so the inverse path is ambiguous. But if we have a given object state, it's very easy to validate if the measurements that we receive match this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this object state. Now, what we basically do is very simple. So we use a rectangular vehicle model, and we basically uh, designed a likelihood for the measurements that we receive, so what kind of measurements, what kind of Doppler velocities we would expect to see. And then we put this rectangle basically in the radar scan, check if it matches, and since it's nonlinear, by because of using the rectangular shape, we use a particle filter <coughs> implementation. So we have several hypotheses of how the object set could look like, and we just validate how well the, uh, the models fit uh, the data that we see. Um, 
Well, that's basically the filtering algorithm. So now we can uh, go back to the initial video and look, uh, uh, have a look at how the results look like. So that's the same scenario again. Now we have two vehicles present in this case. So that's the track one, which is uh, moving just uh, in front of us. And then there's a second track coming up uh, to the left side, there it is, which enters our field of view. And as you can see, we're, we're able to track both vehicles here. So that works uh, fine, I guess. And um, there's one thing that I would like to highlight in this video, which is uh, the instance where the second vehicle enters the field of view. Because as you can see here in the images, we have a, a pretty cluttered uh, uh, scene right now because we have some measurements from the vehicle and some static measurements. And also we do have spurious measurements here from the rotating wheels. So we get different Doppler measurements from the wheels because they're spinning which do not match the body motion of, of the vehicle. So if we use those measurements, that would kind of uh, deteriorate our tracking results. But by not making a single association decision, but considering different association hypotheses, the filter is actually able to distinguish which measurements belong to the object and which measurements don't. And by doing this, we're able to track this vehicle just right through this uh, cluttered scenario. Um, well, I was claiming that uh, I wanted the algorithm to work for complicated maneuvers, so this has just been parallel traffic. So therefore I have a second uh, video, which is a single object scenario, but which is uh, dynamic. <coughs> and basically what we see is a vehicle, so we're, our own vehicle is stationary, but we see another vehicle driving a horizontal eight right in front of us. So this is, well, we definitely have turns here, it's similar to cross traffic, and we're still able to track this vehicle. Um, using the radar measurements that we have. And the amount of measurements that we see strongly varies. So sometimes we have very few measurements, sometimes we have a lot of me measurements. And uh, also from all four sides of the vehicle. Now there's an interesting part that you can see now, if you look at the measurements, you'll see that there's only a few measurements, but we're still able to track the turning vehicle. And that is possible because we use this direct scattering model, which is able to resolve the ambiguities that we have in the data and tells us it's possible that we have a tur turning vehicle here. And so, even though we just have a single measurement, we're able to tell how the vehicle is positioned. This is especially apparent if you look at this picture, because if you just see the measurement, you would think as a human that there's just something, something coming at, right at you. You wouldn't be possible, uh, able to tell how the vehicle is oriented. Now, this brings me uh, to the conclusion. So, our goal was to design this algorithm, which tackles all the three challenges I was talking about, uses all available data, provides size estimates, and works for arbitrary measurements. How did we achieve this? Um, well, we created a multi-object filter, which is based on finite set statistics, so it has a very strong theor theoretical background. It is designed for extended objects, that is, it is designed to use all the measurements that we get. It is able to resolve ambiguities that we see in the data, and um, it solves all the three challenges fully uh, probabilistically. Now, well, in terms of uh, future goals, so what you've seen here is a prototype map lab implementation, so of course this is not real time, uh, what I've shown to you. So definitely we would like to bring this to uh, lower level languages, to the vehicle, and uh, make it work on, on our vehicles uh, in, in real time. Um, well, that's all for the presentation. Um, I'd be very happy to see some of you, uh, if you're interested, to, uh, at uh, this afternoon's poster presentation, to discuss the algorithm more, in more detail, as I was just able to uh, talk very superficially about it. And otherwise, I think we should probably have some time for additional questions. And thank Christian. you. Yes. Okay. Hello, uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, one question I have, I mean, it, it looked like the, the filter that you present resembles uh, a lot to the multiple hypothesis uh, filter. Yeah. So, and, uh, and I wonder if uh, this is not cannot be implemented with the same strategy. What is the main difference with the cluster and, the, and this, no? Okay, yeah, so basically the measurement model that I use here, I think I'm pretty sure you could use it in a multi-hypothesis tracking approach as well. Uh, the difference is here that I'm using this finite set statistics, and the finite set statistics are, well, it's a theoretical framework that tries to solve uh, the multi-object tracking problem um, top-down. So we have the problem, and then we try to uh, kind of to derive a filter that, you, uh, that solves this problem. Whereas I think classical multi-hypothesis tracking approaches just look at the common filter or some classical single object tracking filters 
and then try to kind of combine those filters to solve this multi-object problem. So it's basically just a, a different way of uh, modeling the problem and to uh, uh, work with it. Yeah. Okay, thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. So the next talk uh, is given by uh, Simon altman Sofer and uh, from um, Technische Hochschule in Gostadt, sorry for the accent, and uh, the title of his talk is The Robust Estimation of Vehicle Longitudinal Dynamics Parameters. And the subject is to estimate uh, vehicle parameters to improve uh, vehicle, vehicle longitudinal comfort. For the introduction, um, uh, once again, my name is Simon Altmannshofer. As the name suggests, I'm from Germany, from Technische Hochschule, that's like a uh, university uh, in Neustadt. And I'm presenting on a robust estimator for vehicle longitudinal dynamics parameters. Uh, first of all, I want to yeah, give you motivation why you need uh, the exact um, vehicle longitudinal dynamics parameters. Um, one, one example could be energy efficient um, advanced driving assistance systems. For example, the predictive efficiency assistant um, uses uh, on the one side map data where there is our uh, speed limits and uh, road grade data. And on the other hand, it uses the vehicle longitud longitudinal dynamic to give the driver hints when he should step from uh, off the accelerator pedal so that the vehicle goes into coasting mode or overrun mode and you don't have to brake before a um, speed limit but you're rolling um, with the exact um, speed into this speed limit and you don't waste energy by braking. Uh, other, um, other applications uh, could be a, a range prediction for electric vehicles or also intelligent recuperation as the recuperation is adapted um, depending on the next speed limit. And from the parameter that you want to estimate are mainly the vehicle mass, um, the rolling resistance and the aerodynamic resistance which uh, influence the vehicle while accelerating or coasting. And on the other side you also want to estimate the brake coefficient, that is the coefficient between the um, main brake cylinder of the vehicle and the braking core, which is important for example for um, adaptive cruise control automatic braking. So first of all, um, I'm showing you the, long, uh, the model that we're using. It is a longitudinal um, model of the vehicle, so you roughly see here that, um, mass times velocity equals all acting forces. So we have the propulsion force, braking um, torque, then you have to um, climb the mountain, so there is an inclination force, and you also have the constant uh, rolling resistance here, and the aerodynamic resistance, which is dependent on the square of the velocity. So in the first step, we are um, dividing the uh, uh, driving phase into accelerating or constant driving phases, and on the other hand, we have the braking phases in normal, so in acceleration or constant driving phases, we can estimate the vehicle mass, the rolling resistance, and the aerodynamic resistance, which are labeled here as uh, the mass. The rolling resistance coefficient um, goes in with, uh, together with the mass, so we cannot um, distinguish between both. And the uh, aerodynamic coefficient is one time the this CD factor, and on the other side, the uh, frontal area of the vehicle, which can vary, for example, when you put on a roof box. Uh, this is a simple linear model. You 
can estimate the parameters with a recursively squares algorithm. And you can also do the same in the breaking mode with this model. This breaking um, linear model uses the coefficients from the acceleration phase. So you have here the Mars, the rolling resistance and aerodynamic resistance. And what we want to estimate here is the coefficient between the brake in the main cylinder, uh, pressure in the main brake cylinder, and the uh, uh, braking torque. As I mentioned before, you can use a simple recursively squares algorithm, but um, in real world applications it has some problems, or other, uh, on the other side it does not fulfill the assumptions that the normal RLS algorithm must fulfill. For example, the measurements have shown that there are no Gaussian distribution of the measurement error. There are also lots of um, phases where the um, where the excitation of the system is not um, ex sufficiently excited, and there are also parameter bounds uh, physical, with physical meaning that should be uh, regarded in an adapted algorithm. So first of all, I'm going in detail into the non-Gaussian distribution. Uh, we have done a lot of measurements from, uh, with different vehicles from subcompact class to full-size SUVs. And the residual or the measurement uh, error has shown um, here in blue that it is not Gaussian distributed. For example, we fitted or tried to fit a Gaussian or normal distribution, in, but it was not really um, sufficient. And we looked for other um, distribution functions, and we found that the student's team distribution function does more better fit into this um, real data distribution. The problem with um, assuming a Gaussian or uh, normal distribution is that huge um, measurement errors are totally overrated due to the quadratic cost function of the uh, normal or of the normal recursively squares algorithm. So what we are doing is we use uh, the adapted um, cost function here in red, which does not uh, overemphasize these huge uh, measurement errors. This can be uh, simply um, included in the, into the RLS algorithm by um, weighting, by a weighted RLS algorithm. You see here the weighting function, it's quite simple, and it is, uh, what it does can be seen on the right, side, right hand side here. The normal RLS algorithm has a weighting of one for all, uh, residuals and the uh, robust M estimator um, has this adaptive uh, weighting function that weights huge residuals with lower weights and thus making the algorithm more robust. The next problem is that we have um, phases where the uh, excitation of the system is not, not fulfilled. For example, when we are uh, at driving at a constant speed, we do not have and acceleration as well we have as well that we have constant speed. This is so far in problem because when you have no acceleration, the error in your Mars does not have an influence on your estimation. So the vehicle can also be ten, uh, ten tons, while the estimation could be ten tons. When you multiply ten with zero, then it yeah, gives zero. And the other problem is um, at constant speed, it, the algorithm cannot distinguish between the constant and the uh, um, square and the, um, and the resistance dependent on the square of the velocity because the velocity is also constant. This can be seen in the covariance matrix of the RSS algorithm, which um, grows in situations of low excitation. For example, here at the beginning we have a phase with constant speed, and in this um, situation, the covariance matrix um, yeah, grows up, and this is a um, problem when excitation returns because then you can have big um, yeah, jumps in your estimated parameters. On the other hand, um, you want to. Uh,
uh, this can be, or this program can be solved by um, doing an adaptive forgetting factor. So a normal RLS algorithm has this constant forgetting factor, and always when you have insufficient excitation, the covariance matrix um, grows up. So we are using an adaptive um, forgetting factor, which includes the, um, which depends on the excitation, and you also can give this um, this uh, adaptive algorithm this um, PD uh, matrix, which is the um, matrix where the co uh, covariance matrix um, goes to when it is when it when it when the system is excited, and when the system is not ex excited, then the covariance covariance matrix stays at this value, which can be seen here for the same test drive. During this situation with low excitation, the covariance matrix does not grow anymore. The next point that we emphasized on was uh, parameter constraints. So you know beforehand uh, physical meaningful bounds of the estimates. For example, the mass has a lower and upper limit, as well as the <coughs> resistance coefficients. So they cannot be negative. And the first thing that you can do is do a simple parameter projection, which is not actually optimal. That can be seen in this simple example. For example, you have this unconstrained solution here. When you're doing a simple projection, you're landing on this uh, point, which directly lies on the parameter bound. But it is clear that this point is not optimal because this green cross here has a much lower uh, value of the cost function than this simple projection algorithm. So we use the um, yeah, optimization-based RLS algorithm where you put the parameter bounds into a linear inequality constraints. Then you form a Lagrangian of the normal RLS cost function together with these linear inequality constraints. And you yeah, reformulate it as a linear complementary program which can be solved by uh, computational efficient uh, pivoting algorithms. Yeah, that's the role algorithm. Um, it includes the before mentioned problem, so it is robust against outliers. It is robust in situations with low excitation, and it also includes the before known um, parameter bounds. Uh, furthermore, it, is, it is, has low computational load, so it is easy to implement it on a weekly ECU. For example, this here is the pseudo code of the whole algorithm. So just a few, um, just a few operations. We've also done some uh, fecal experiments. Here is um, yeah, one, one example with an SUV on public roads, so there are no um, special drive maneuvers, so there are all, all day drive maneuvers. Um, you have here the mass estimation, and red is this new robust algorithm compared to an uh, ordinary RLS algorithm, and a um, multiple forgetting um, recursively squares algorithm that was uh, proposed uh, by another author. And you can see that the red line is much more robust, for example, these chunks here, in the mass estimation or these jumps in the uh, abrupt changes in the resistance estimation are not um, in this robust estimator. And what can also be seen is that the sufficient ex excitation, for example, for the fetal velocity here in an urban area is limited. And what happens with the ordinary RLS algorithm is that uh, the parameters uh, drift away slowly, for example here for the rolling resistance, and this error is compensated in the aerodynamic resistance by going directly into the other direction. So here you can see an estimation of mass, uh, rolling and aerodynamic resistance, and we also emphasized on the braking coefficient. Um, you can here see the braking pressure and here on the upper um, chart, you can see the estimated parameter. And in this case, it is much in the breaking case, it is much more easy, easier to estimate because the um, 
forces during break-in are much higher than during the propulsion phases. Okay, so um, yeah, the main contribution of this work is that we uh, um, had a problem that is um, yeah, well known, mass and resistance estimation, um, but we made an intelligent algorithm that emphasizes on special problems like the non-Gaussian distribution, the insufficient excitation, and we also include parameter constraints. And open problems are still the parameterization of the algorithm, so you <coughs> have to uh, parameterize, for example, the um, distribution function, the student t function, and other problems are the testing algorithm that we can be sure that the algorithm is always doing the right thing also in serious protection vehicles. Okay, thanks for your attention. Uh, if you've got questions, I'm now here and also later at the poster exhibition. say it's real-time uh, computation, can you give us uh, some precision about the, the time to compute of the process? Um, it is also already integrated in an ECU, it is running on, on a 100 milliseconds task, but the total amount of calculations are much, much less. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Thank you again. <laughs> okay, it's time for the next speaker. And, and it will be Christopher Wu who will present this paper. Maneuver segmentation using smartphone sensors. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Wu. Uh, Together with my uh, co-author, uh, uh, Professor Dana Coolidge, we're from the University of Waterloo. Uh, today I'll be talking about maneuver segmentation using smartphone sensors. So, uh, I'll give a quick introduction to the topic. Uh, what we want to do is uh, perform driving maneuver detection uh, to support uh, anal analyzing uh, driving behavior. There's a few applications that come to mind immediately. The first of which is uh, usage-based insurance. As well, uh, we want to uh, help uh, support uh, training new drivers as well. And additionally, uh, detect unsafe uh, driving behaviors, such as uh, fatigue driving, uh, distracted driving, uh, and so forth. Um, so the choice of sensor platform is very critical to the adoption of uh, any new proposed approach. For our proposed approach, we propose using uh, a smartphone device. Uh, and in fact, the state of the art uh, suggests that uh, onboard diagnostic devices be used or uh, mounted uh, array, sensor array. Uh, now, smartphones have the advantage in that uh, they have a lot of uh, sensors embedded in the device already. For instance, global positioning systems, uh, uh, the sensor for the GPS, and uh, inertial measurement units. Additionally, uh, the smartphones are ubiquitous. Half of you guys in the audience probably are holding one in your hand right now. Uh, as well, uh, in current uh, operating systems, uh, the API uh, is common enough uh, so that, uh, that any application developed can be uh, deployed in mass. Furthermore, uh, uh, unlike uh, onboard diagnostic devices or sensor arrays, there's no hardware installation needed. Now, because there's a new sensor involved, there's also a new reference frame. So the uh, sensor uh, for the smartphone device uh, to the car, uh, the rotation matrix between it, needs to be calculated. There are some uh, pros and cons of using a classifier-based approach. 
uh, for maneuver recognition. The first of which, uh, you get to uh, learn the optimal decision boundaries for each individual maneuvers. <coughs> Furthermore, you also get to learn the most discriminant, uh, discriminant uh, features uh, in the feature set. However, uh, as every da data scientist knows, you need a large uh, pool of data to uh, obtain your training data from. Furthermore, this uh, training data needs to be accurately labeled. Uh, a few uh, uh, literature uh, works in literature uh, have been reviewed. Uh, the first of which uh, use uh, well, a lot of them use well-established classifiers. Uh, for instance, uh, decision trees, neural networks, dynamic time working have all been uh, used before. Um, some novel techniques uh, involve uh, using features such as uh, bump analysis on uh, <coughs> using the angular velocity signal. Uh, by axial acceleration uh, regions, as well, uh, cameras have also been uh, proposed uh, to tap into the video feed. Now, uh, each of these methods have uh, their own sets of issues, um, and uh, we basically, uh, for instance, uh, cameras, they have visibility limitations in certain situations, uh, such as uh, lighting, weather, um, furthermore, uh, generalization of the proposed methods uh, are also an issue. Uh, small trip counts, uh, small driver pools, uh, uh, cause the uh, validation of the uh, method uh, to be uh, uh, questioned. Uh, furthermore, uh, the usability of the method uh, is another key issue. Um, as mentioned before, uh, the onboard diagnostic device uh, and as well uh, any sensor array, the orientation is uh, known beforehand. And we try to address these issues in the proposed approach. Now, our proposed approach is very simple. Uh, what we want to do is generally generate simulation data for classifier training. Uh, we achieve this by using a Markov decision <coughs> process. Uh, next, we uh, use feature selection and feature reduction uh, before uh, feeding it into uh, training our classifier. We then train a classifier using uh, the support, machine, uh, support vector machine uh, using the simulated data we generate. Uh, we then proceed to estimate the uh, phone to car uh, rotation matrix from trip measurements using a novel technique uh, we developed. Uh, finally, we validate our approach uh, using actual driving data. Now, I'll give a highlight uh, and overview of the simulation uh, process uh, we performed. <coughs> Uh, as mentioned before, we use a markup decision process uh, to uh, simulate uh, the driver decisions. Uh, we further uh, uh, simulate the kinematics uh, of the uh, driving behavior uh, using a velocity and steering control, um, using a linear, uh, a linear uh, controller and carrot controller, respectively. Um, now, as everyone also knows, uh, sensors have uh, measurement uh, errors. Uh, and we tried to inject a uh, simulated uh, noise to replicate this in simulation. Uh, for the IMU, we add Gaussian noise. Uh, for the GPS velocity, we also add Gaussian noise. Uh, now, road curvature is something uh, that we observe in the trips as well. Uh, for those uh, uh, roads that aren't completely straight, uh, and we achieve this by adding a Gaussian probability density uh, function uh, to the angular velocity signal. Uh, we then uh, proceed to develop a state estimator to help reject the measurement noise. Um, this is uh, how we train our classifier. We first uh, select uh, individual features. Uh, we generate a feature vector uh, by using a sliding window of five seconds uh, through the linear and angular velocity uh, signals. Uh, we then uh, proceed uh, to perform uh, feature reduction to remove uh, most of the temporal correlations uh, through principal component analysis. And we truncate uh, the first, uh, the coefficient matrix to the first uh, five principal components. Uh, the reason is, uh, as seen in the screen plot here, um, the uh, explained variance quickly drops off uh, after the elbow and is quite negligible after uh, the fifth principal component. So we use that as a threshold. Uh, we then train the multi-class uh, classifier 
uh, a support vector machine uh, using the simulated data we generate. Uh, and we use the radial basis function kernel. Uh, we use the radial basis function kernel because uh, after testing with the linear and polynomial uh, kernels, uh, we found that the RBF kernel works the best. Uh, Finally, we employ a grid search uh, approach to uh, select optimal training parameters. All right, uh, the novel technique for our uh, rotation uh, matrix estimation. Now, uh, what we assume is that the phone is fixed in an arbitrary orientation relative to the uh, vehicle's frame of reference uh, for the entire trip. Uh, what we need to do is identify the phone orientation for each individual trip. Uh, and we achieve this by performing principal component analysis on the three-axis gyroscope signal. What we found, and this is very important, is that each principal component corresponds to a separate axis in the vehicle frame. Uh, this is the vehicle frame. Uh, what we found was that uh, principal component uh, one corresponds to the yaw axis. Uh, so that would be turning left and right. Uh, PC2 corresponds to pitch whereas PC3 uh, corresponds to roll. And this is uh, quite novel because uh, not only uh, it, do you get the uh, rotation matrix without modeling, uh, without extensive modeling, but uh, the rotation matrix is uh, already orthogonal. Now, uh, our data collection process. As mentioned, uh, we use uh, simulated data. And we use simulated data for training and testing. Um, we first uh, uh, emulate naturalistic driving, uh, and we generate around 25 minutes of uh, simulated data at an update rate of uh, 100 hertz, uh, which is uh, quite common in, uh, in industry. Uh, and this generates 150,000 data points per trial, and you can freely generate this as uh, much as you want. Um, furthermore, uh, we simulate uh, steering and uh, velocity control in our simulation. Um, and finally, uh, we randomize some of the uh, maneuvers and velocity changes using normally distributed uh, parameters. Uh, there are a few tools we use. Uh, we developed an uh, Android application using the Android API. Uh, we deployed this application uh, on a Samsung Galaxy S4 uh, device uh, running Android 4.4.2. Uh, and we validated uh, our approach over 12 trips. Uh, in terms of uh, trip validation using actual data, uh, the process is very simple. We uh, fix the smartphone to the cup holder, uh, which is near the center of gravity of the uh, vehicle. Um, we start the data collection process. Uh, we estimate the rotation uh, matrix using the proposed approach uh, uh, presented before. Uh, we then label uh, the driving maneuvers using the trained classifier. Uh, and finally, uh, we validate uh, the labels using the ground truth uh, we manually labeled uh, from measurements and uh, geolocation. Um, so we have uh, also uh, validation uh, trials for the uh, rotation matrix estimation. Uh, and there's two sets of trials uh, that we perform. Uh, the first of which uh, is what I call flat trials. Uh, in the flat trials uh, depicted in the uh, left figure uh, is where the phone is uh, completely aligned with the car's reference frame. Uh, this is important because uh, it provides us with a baseline as uh, there should be uh, no rotation uh, uh, for, this, uh, for these trials. Uh, we performed uh, seven of these such trials. Uh, the second uh, set is uh, which I call wedge trials uh, is where the phone is misaligned uh, in a known orientation. Uh, and uh, this is depicted on the right, uh, and we perform five of these trials. Together, uh, uh, what we want to do is extract useful information from the angular velocity. Uh, we achieve this by uh, calculating uh, a, a PCA on the gyroscope signal, as mentioned before. We apply the rotation matrix on the gyroscope signal, uh, and we truncate using PC1 uh, to obtain the uh, yaw uh, measurement. Uh, uh, your, yaw estimate. And we compare the estimated uh, yaw signal with uh, the gravity vector uh, calibrated uh, signal. Uh, and here are the results. 
Uh, they're very uh, good. Uh, in fact, uh, we achieve, uh, over all the trials, we achieve a, a RMS error of 0.0026 radians per second, uh, and uh, a signal-to-noise ratio of 1,538. Needless to say, uh, the two graphs overlap, uh, and we get an error in the magnitudes of 10 to the negative 3. Uh, this is simply one of the uh, exemplar trials, uh, but all of the trials uh, in the TRIPS we've tested uh, show consistent results. All right, uh, our maneuvers of interest. Uh, we have uh, a few subset uh, right here. Uh, we want to analyze a stopped, uh, accelerating, decelerating, left intersection turns, and right intersection turns. Uh, these are uh, some of the basic ones uh, found in the literature. Um, by uh, applying our classifier, uh, we also uh, achieve uh, some very promising results uh, from uh, the labels. Uh, these results are aggregated across all the trips we've tested, uh, and uh, what we do is we calculate the F1 score, uh, our top uh, performing classifier using uh, these parameters uh, is 82%, uh, we also calculated the balance accuracy, uh, which we achieved 89%, uh, precision uh, 82%, as well as uh, recall rate uh, 83%. So there are a few key points I want you to take away from my talk today. Um, the first of which is that simulated uh, training data uh, is very useful uh, to train a uh, maneuver classifier. Uh, training on simulated data uh, is effective, it provides good performance on real data. Uh, simulated data is cheap, uh, cheaply and easily generated. Uh, you can always swap out uh, for another model uh, if you find that that model is more promising. Uh, and finally, uh, ground truth uh, is known in simulation. Uh, next, uh, we found that the uh, sliding window uh, as well as uh, PCA is useful in uh, obtaining input features for classifier training. Uh, next. Uh, we found that uh, uh, we are able to correctly uh, estimate the arbitrary phone orientations using the uh, uh, PCA method uh, to find the rotation matrix. Uh, finally, uh, we achieved good classification uh, performance using our proposed methodology, which is uh, we truncate to the first five principal components uh, over a five uh, second sliding window, uh, and we achieve an F1 score of 82%. Uh, so there are a few uh, directions for our future work, uh, the first of which is uh, we want to uh, explore additional features uh, such as uh, radius of curvature, uh, magnetometer, uh, using the magnetometer sensor. Uh, next, we also want to uh, investigate additional maneuvers. Uh, as mentioned before, we only uh, analyzed uh, five of them. However, uh, some uh, potential ones that we could look into is uh, highway ramps or ramps in general, uh, roundabouts, which are quite common in European countries and uh, a bit in Canada as well, where we're from. Uh, and we also want to investigate uh, different road types, uh, for instance, highway driving. Uh, we already have some uh, highway uh, trips uh, that we've collected. We haven't analyzed them yet. Though. Uh, finally, uh, we want to uh, see if we can uh, apply particle uh, classifier or insolvable method approaches uh, using our proposed methodology uh, and uh, account for uh, any behavioral changes perhaps uh, between uh, different scenarios uh, as well uh, perhaps uh, classifiers can specialize in a subset of maneuvers, for instance, uh, straight maneuvers, uh, turn maneuvers, uh, which uh, may provide better performance moving forward. Here are my references. Uh, we have a uh, poster, uh, I have a poster uh, at this time, uh, and I'll be at the track one uh, session. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Oh, uh, do I get to pick? <laughs> Uh, I just want to be sure, your validation track, did it include any inclines, declines, and curved turns, for example? That's the one thing. And the other thing is um, where you see the mobility of the mobile phone inside the car going. Uh, sorry, what was the second question? The mobility, so the change of orientation of the okay. mobile phone inside the car. Okay, so the first one is simple. Um, 
uh, in Waterloo, uh, which is where the data is collected, there are a lot of hills and a lot of uh, curvy roads. Uh, compared to Toronto, where there are just generally straight roads. So yes, uh, road curvature and uh, hills uh, were uh, validated uh, over our uh, data set. Uh, to address the uh, second question, um, the phone was in a fixed uh, orientation uh, within the car. Uh, we did have some trials that uh, I took out of the data set uh, because the phone shifted. Um, to address that problem though, uh, instead of uh, using our PCA method on the entire trip, uh, one thing uh, we can do is uh, uh, analyze a subset uh, of the trip itself where the phone is fixed. Uh, once the phone uh, orient, uh, changes uh, orientation, we re-estimate the uh, rotation matrix using uh, a new uh, stream of data. Any other questions? Thank you. I don't think we have time for more questions. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So next we go to a speech from uh, Alto University in Finland, and it's called Energy Harvesting System for Intelligent Tire Sensors. So please. from Alta University and today I am telling you a little bit about our research in energy harvesting system for intelligent tire sensors. So to tell you a little bit of the background of our research, as you all know, there is more and more intelligent in vehicles and this leads to improved safety, efficiency and user comfort. And as the sensor technology advances, there are very robust low power sensors available and we have high interest in measuring pressure, temperature and acceleration among other things inside the tires. However, tires present a unique challenge. How do we power the sensors inside the tires? As you can all imagine, the tires are rotating, be surprised there, and we need to find a way to provide power to those sensors and replacing a battery is kind of inconvenient and you can all imagine that if you would need to charge a battery inside a tire, that's not too comfortable either. So our approach is to harvest energy from the rotational movement of the tire. The goal of our research is to design a complete system which has all the needed power, regulation and rectification and storage functions and make it compatible with different kinds of harvester topologies. And also, we measure the performance of the harvester on resistive loads, and then measure the complete system, how much power we can obtain from this rotational movement of a tire. And finally, we tested the system in the actual tire under realistic con conditions, and once we had captured the research data, we actually stress tested the device by increasing the rotational speed and the load until the device would break down, just to find out which are the limits of the design system. There is a lot of previous work in this field, so the idea of harvesting energy from the tire itself is not novel. And if you are interested in the previous innovations, I suggest you look up this paper from Kuppa, as they have made a very comprehensive study on the field. So basically, there are these electromagnetic, electrostatic, piezoelectric, thermal, and even more exotic methods, such as using radioactive decay to excite the harvester inside the tire. In general, 
there are from some microwatts to some hundreds of microwatts power obtained, and electromagnetic and piezoelectric methods have been most popular recently. To design the system, we looked inside the <coughs> accuracy profile inside the tire. So we had an accelerometer looked inside the inner surface of the tire and then measured the G forces it will encounter. As is expected, most of the energy is in G axis towards the center of the tire. And the energy is in few tens of hertz range, which might be relevant if the harvester is using some sort of resonance to produce the power. There are a lot of practical considerations when building this harvester. For example, the output might be alternating current, but most of, or actually every existing sensor system using digital components I know of needs direct current at well regulated voltage level. The impedance and voltage of the harvester might vary, so you might have a very high impedance, very high voltage, which in essence means that you have a high voltage until you start taking out the power from the harvester and then the voltage will kind of collapse. Or you might have a harvester with very low output voltage and very low output impedance, which means that you can take as much current as you like, but the voltage is very low and you need to find a way to use this low voltage. And then there is this performance of the harvester under load. So some harvesters are very precise about how do you the energy from them, so they may have very strict requirements in the relationship of current and voltage that is being taken from them. Then there is the circuit performance concerns, how much it does use for the power in the circuitry itself, how much the harvester needs for these power regulation functions. Then there is this energy storage. Of course it would be sort of convenient to have a huge battery, but a huge battery would come with huge mass size and with this mass and size you will start to have problems with mechanical endurance because there is this high acceleration inside the tire any mass is trying to fly around the tire and you can all imagine what happens when there is a chunk flying around inside a rotating tire in highway speeds here is the system we ended up with so we have the stiff wrapper layer absorbing the impacts glued down on the tire surface a flexible rubber surface glued down to stiff rubber surface to provide flexibility for the base of the system. Then we have this housing made out of acrylic plastic and inside we have a piezoelectric disc with magnets as proof mass to couple the mechanical energy in the strain in the piezo. And finally on top of the system we have a printed circuit board and a supercapacitor as an energy storage. And here you can see the completed system. And this piezoelectric disc produces alternating current. And for rectification, we simply use a diode capacitor chain. Maximum power point tracking, which addresses this concern of loading the circuit, was implemented with energy harvesting integrated circuit with integrated maximum power point tracking functionality. The characteristics of the harvester. Most of the power was produced during this tire road contact moment. So whenever the tire contacts the road, there is deformation, and this deformation sends the harvester into motion, and this motion will then strain the piezo, which produces power. And piezo electric harvester has very high output voltage and very high output impedance. So even though on resistive loads we can get a lot of voltage, we cannot take a lot of current out of it. And the harvester circuit was clamped by the or the harvester output was clamped by the input of the harvester circuit. And that made the maximum power point tracking very important for the practical production of power. The integrated circuit regulates the output to 3.3 volts maximum, which is usable by modern microcontrollers. And maximum speed we could obtain before breaking down the harvester was 60 kilometers per hour. And maximum power we could reach at that 60 kilometers per hour was around 88 microwatts. 
The performance was measured by installing the harvester inside the tire on a chassis dynamometer and then using a slip ring to take out the voltage measurement points. The harvester was driven and the voltage of the supercapacitor was monitored and by the change of the voltage we could calculate the change of the energy inside the supercapacitor and once we know how long we have accumulated energy and how much energy has been accumulated, we can calculate the average power over time. The results on comparison to the current state of the art, so there have been for many years these electromagnetic and piezoelectric harvesters, and they have produced from some tens of microwatts to even 4 milliwatts of power. For comparison, these power outputs, it is very important to realize that there is no single standard measurement setup, so you always have to look up how exactly the power consumption was measured. Was it root mean square on a resistive load? Was it an instant uh, peak voltage or peak power over some load? Or was it a change of energy to some sort of storage mechanism? So, our harvester produced 88 microwatts, stored power over 10 minutes of test drive at 6 km per hour, with tire being loaded at 2 kN. And to search more current state of the art, once again, please have a look at this Kupas paper, or 10 more recent results from Wang and Shang can be also found. To conclude the presentation, we built a complete self-contained harvester, which could store the energy output. And the measuring method of the harvested power was based on this energy change inside a supercapacitor. The power output we obtained is very comparable to current state of the art, but as mentioned earlier, there is no standard test process for this kind of energy harvesters yet. And this 88 microwatts we produced is enough for periodic data burst. So you could power a tire pressure monitoring system, for example, as they will maybe wake up once in a minute, send a burst of power, and then go back to sleep. However, in the previous presentation, there was this accelerometer on a smartphone using 100 Hz data rate, and there is no way our harvester could power sensor like that at this time. And mechanical reliability is a large practical concern in this system. So the system broke down a lot of times before we could actually have it stand for this 60 km per hour. And in practice, if the harvester breaks down at 60 km per hour, it is not very useful in highway speeds. Thank you. So, how much power do we need to send the tire pressure information to the... I think the last figure I read was in something like 10 millivolts. So, you could send maybe once a minute a data burst with that kind of power being stored. Actually, I would have to do the math for that number, maybe once a few minutes, but that's kind of the scale. Every few minutes, one data burst using a modern low power radio. Okay, thank you. So, you had, you had mentioned that if the thing broke down in the sense because you had used glue, does it simply glued off from the surface or is, was it like, uh, you know, the piezoelectric circuit broke or what exactly was the problem? In the final test at 6 km per hour, the glue interface broke down before we had this supercapacitor flying off the printer circuit board. So, in essence, you need to use surface mounted components whenever possible because they have a large shoulder area to mass raise up. So, they are very strictly held in place. But once you have a large component, a supercapacitor or a battery, you're going to have a small 
solder the mass pressure, and that means that there is very little solder holding the component in place, and these large components may fail. And of course, there are long-term reliability concerns over the course of the years with all the vibration and shock. But to answer the question in brief, the blue interface broke down. Okay, thanks again. So all this presentation are to present it in the post, uh, poster session number three this afternoon. So you can uh, discuss with the speaker and have a more uh, deeper uh, discussion. So now we can close uh, this session. And uh, thanks again for all speakers and for your, your, your attention. <laughs>